I know it doesn't look very glamorous, but I'm talking to you from dab smack in the middle of one of Hollywood's biggest studios, Universal. And lurking somewhere behind me in one of these unattractive looking trailers is the creative force behind one of the most successful low budget horror movies of recent years, The Evil Dead, and its imaginatively titled sequel, The Evil Dead 2, Mr. Sam Raimi. I was just wondering, do they have blood banks in England? No, but they have a Liverpool. <laughs> when The Evil Dead was released in 1982, it attracted rave reviews. Stephen King called it the most ferociously original horror film of the year. Yet the film had initially been turned down by every American distributor who had seen it. Evil Dead was an independent production, financed by a group of doctors, lawyers and dentists from America's Midwest. And it marked the feature film debut of writer and director Sam Raimi, who remarkably was only 19 at the time. There are two schools of thought, I think, for horror filmmakers. One is that the audience can always create something more horrible than you can show them. And the other school of thought is show them, show them, show them everything. And I believe that both is true. I believe the audience can come up with something more horrible in their minds than I can show them, provided they're given the raw materials to construct something. And I also believe that I have got some pretty horrible things to show myself, so I try and mix and match. I try and scare them and weird them out with visuals, and I try and leave room for them to add their own ingredients to create. Although this was his first feature, Sam had already directed a handful of Super 8 movies, which had given him the chance to develop a distinctive and confident style. How did you get started in filmmaking in the first place? What kind of movies were you making before The Evil Dead? Before The Evil Dead, my, par my friends and myself, just a group of school chums and, and, and I, would make Super 8 uh, comedies, Three Stooges comedies. I think you're a punk. I'm not. All you do with punks that don't know nothing. No, 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 no. Please, boys, control yourselves. Listen, you hit a man with glasses, would you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, my, my glasses. Let's see. Uh, what? Ah! There they are. Ah! <laughs> oh, my glasses. Oh, it's you, Paul. I'm glad I ran across you. <laughs> there was a nucleus of about six of us who had this interest, and we all were split apart in different neighborhoods. We had a little neighborhood here, and Sam was over in his little neighborhood making Super 8 movie. He was Sam did a lot of magic, and so films seemed like a natural extension for him to do that. And so he was doing these silly little movies, and I was doing um, silly little movies. And another guy, Scott Spiegel, who co-wrote Evil Dead 2, was making like Three Stooge ripoffs, where he'd use the actual soundtrack but put in his own visuals. And then we kind of all hooked up in high school, and then we found that you know one guy had costumes and another guy had some had a good camera so we combined all of our facilities and then we were able to on weekends we just would go out and shoot bruce campbell starred in every super 8 movie that we made because very simply he was the good looking one and still is so we said hmm the girls like you we'll put you in front of the camera the girls don't like us we'll stay behind the camera and uh only when bruce was unavailable would we put ourselves in front of the camera you, you show some raw acting ability in those. Why didn't you stay in front more? Why did you, did you stay? <laughs> I don't. I don't think I showed any acting ability, and I stick my face in any movie that I can, truthfully, shamelessly, 
to get my mug on the screen. And this is for all the times you mistreated me. Hit him that hard? I didn't hit him that hard. I hit him like this. You did not. You hit him like this. Oh, it was more like this. Crazy. It was softer than that. It was like this. Will you, will you stop? Wait a minute. You forgot your suitcase. Why have the Three Stooges such an influence on you? What do you like about them? I like the fact I like their physical comedy and their sound effects. <laughs> you know the the hyper real uh, shticks that they do, and um, they just make me laugh. They just make me laugh, and I've seen them make big audiences laugh in the, in the theaters. get the jewel for us. Tell us about six months to live. That's not a Three Stooges plot, is it? It's Three Stooge-like. And certainly we've ripped off, stolen blatantly, as 16-year-olds, many Three Stooges gags and did them ourselves. Um, so it was greatly influenced by the Three Stooges. So where would you show these films? In classrooms and at home? Or? Yes, exactly. To the other students. Would you charge money? Sure. <laughs> as much as we could get. Usually a quarter. I'm a Bill Burr Doughboy with fresh cooking ideas. <laughs> what are you doing? No one you dare hit me. Help! <laughs> Sam and his school friends had ambitious plans. They wanted to raise money for a full-length feature. And although their Super 8s had been mostly comedies, they decided their first real film would be horror. Ugh. The incredibly strange film show will continue on TDC TV. This year, Kraft is helping to feed our athletes as they train for the 1992 U.S. Olympic team. Because we know after a hard day's work, there's nothing better than coming home to a good meal. Kraft, setting the training table for the 1992 U.S. Olympic team. And now, every Kraft coupon you redeem from Sunday's paper helps support our team. During the course of one 60-minute workout, the body can be depleted of vitamins B6 and C, carbohydrates, and valuable potassium. On TDC TV. Sam and I first decided to do a horror film after doing research on, on what pictures did well in the markets. And at the time, which was the late 70s, there were still a lot of drive-ins, especially in the Midwest where we grew up. And there were forever horror films playing in the drive-ins on double bills and that which we always saw and said, God, we can make something better than this. We, there's absolutely no doubt about it. So up until the, like, the time we decided to make a feature film, we had uh, done mainly comedies and decided that uh, horror is the entry level that most people use and decided to make the ultimate experience in horror at the time. Robert Tappert, Bruce Campbell, and myself all bought business suits and uh, matching briefcases and uh, dropped out of school. Then we worked as waiters, busboys, janitors, cab drivers. So how old were you then? Uh, 18. And uh, Bruce was 19 and Robert was 22 at the time. We would sit down and pretend that we were businessmen. That was all part of the filmmaking process. We thought we had to do it because it never occurred to us to go to California because it was 3,000 miles away. And we thought we'd have as good a chance raising money independently and it finally worked. We first got jobs so that we could raise seed money then we hired attorneys to put together a legal offering saying, in legal terms, if X person invests X amount of money, they own X percentage in this movie that we're going to make. <laughs> we then made a Super 8 movie called Within the Woods. And uh, this was a small version of the screenplay I had written for Evil Dead. <laughs> The reason we made this picture was to show the potential investors that these kids, us, that we could make a picture that worked, a horror movie that actually could scare them. I mean, that was our goal, at least. I hope it scared them. Hey, the door. Yeah, we 
wanted to have a terrible creature, a spirit, something that floated through the woods at a different height than we're used to seeing things. So we used a shaky cam. We came up with a board where we mounted the camera in the middle and the lens act as the, uh, acted as the axis point and uh, it's ended up smoothing out the point of view because the longer the board was that the camera was mounted on, uh, it, the jiggle, this, this effect, Oh, cinema very tight air. <laughs> uh, decreased proportionate to the length of the board. So it gave us a very eerily smooth look and uh, it seemed to work out okay. Within the Woods was made as the bait for potential investors, but the tricky part was to get them to watch it. What we did was we would call them and say, yes, we're a friend of Dr. Perkinson's and he's gave you, uh, he has given us your name and said that although he could not invest, you might be able to. Well, uh, I certainly can invest. I, I can't invest. I won't have anything to do with you. Well, why don't you let us come by your house and uh, show you our picture uh, within the Woods and see if you might be interested after that. Well, I'm not really interested. Well, we'll be by around 8 o'clock. <laughs> so we'd kind of force our way in and get the foot in the door. Then we'd set up our Super 8 projector and uh, show the movies on his dining room wall, take down some art, and uh, proceed to make them sick, and then hopefully uh, get the investment out of them. We had dentists, a couple of dentists go in. We had some real estate people. But it was tough to get people who had money in, who were who merchants who owned stores because a lot of those people had money and we, we would approach them. They're used to paying money and getting heads of lettuce or bottles of wine and we wanted them to give us money for nothing for this movie that might be successful might not. And I remember we showed this first little Super 8 movie in the, the detergent aisle of a grocery store after it closed to a couple of merchants and they didn't invest. But we really went to, we went to absolutely anybody who was financially capable of losing all their money. Their perseverance paid off. After dozens of private screenings, they finally raised $90,000 and the Evil Dead got underway. It's got all the ingredients of a classic horror film. Five teenagers, a deserted log cabin, a car that won't start, a thunderstorm, and a tape recorder with a mysterious message. the pseudo hero Ash who was really just one of five generic people at the beginning and then through a, a trial by fire I kind of wise up a little bit and live why pseudo hero because he's kind of an idiot you know if he hears a sound he goes outside he looks through doors that you know he shouldn't so he's not really very smart but then that's the state for the whole movie isn't well it? you have to if you can't if they were smart enough not to go to the cabin you wouldn't have a movie so you know, they show up and it's a creepy place. Well, let's go in. You know, and they found a tape recorder with some weird sayings on it. Oh, that sounds great. Let's play that. <laughs> you know, and then people are possessed and like, oh, what do we do now? And uh, you can't be too smart the first couple of times. You let some monsters kill some innocent people. But it's important to have victims. So we were really, five of us were victims. So I was a pseudo hero only because I was really a victim for most of the movie.
feel under a lot of pressure while you were shooting it? Yes, I felt under great pressure. And it was not artistic pressure, it was all financial pressure. Because there were no expectations on me as a kid. It was all a question of, I have $90,000 of these people's money who I promised I would make a good movie out of. This has got to be good. It's strange, but that's where I was coming from back then. So what do you think would have happened if the movie hadn't been hit? Well, then I would uh, be selling air conditioners again, which I'm pretty good at. You see this little baby that'll put out 200 BTUs. It'll cool a room basically 20 by 40, and uh, if you want to blow it around with a fan, I got that too. Uh, sell air conditioners was terrible. <laughs> so did they make the money back? In fact, on Evil Dead number one, we've returned to the investors about three and a half times our original investment. How much control did they exercise over the movie? Did they keep in touch and keep an eye on how things were going? No, they were very good to us, actually, the investors. They never hassled us. We would, uh, we would give them a, a bi-weekly letter to tell them where we were and what was going on. Uh, at this point, the picture is in editing, the picture is uh, in music, the picture is in dubbing. And uh, then we sent them two invitations to the uh, world premiere. are done very simply, but they're really effective. I mean, why is it you think other people will spend so much time and money doing things that often don't look as good? I think it's the same syndrome for all low-budget filmmakers. They just don't have the money to do it right, so they've got to do it... They've got to sit down and figure it out. Well, how can I make somebody float? Well, they, something has to lift them up. Well, what's going to lift them up? Wires? I don't have wires thin enough, nor do I have a rig to mount to the ceiling of this place. What else? So uh, I think it's just common sense. So do you think as you move into a bigger budget that you might lose some of your common sense and start? Yeah. I think that that happens. I think you suddenly s say, how can I get someone to float? An anti-grav disc. How much will it cost to make an anti-grav <laughs> disc? I think that's, that, that is a danger. <laughs> investors came up to me after the movie and said, and they were a little bit angry, you told me you were going to make a horror picture. Now, this is a comedy. Well, it's a horror picture with the elements of comedy. I, But when the checks started coming in, when it turned out that we had made something that could actually sell, um, they loosened up and realized that we hadn't let them down. How did you go about getting a distribution deal? Rob Tappert, Bruce Campbell, and myself uh, went to the home of distributors, New York, first. And we crashed on people's floors. And I remember one place, we didn't have enough money to rent a hotel room or a motel room, so Bruce called this girl that he knew liked him. Say, uh, Betty, I'm going to come by your place. I'm in town. Oh, great. Come on by, Bruce. Hey, can I stay the night? Sure, I'd love it. She was coming on to him in Detroit. So <laughs> Bruce go, shows up at her door. She opens it. Bruce, I... Rob and I are there. Hello, <laughs> hello, we're here too. She went, oh, you're all here. Okay, come on in. You can stay the night. So it was a nightmare. To use this woman's apartment, we had to dupe her, first of all. And then Rob and I would hear this horrible struggle going on in the back room. This apartment was no bigger than this room. Her advances on Bruce. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was trying to fall asleep, pretending it didn't exist. She had six cats in this apartment. <laughs> Not that I was in any position to complain, mind you. I'm just saying that when I awoke, I slept in a bed of cat hair. <laughs> when I awoke, my face had a, all puffed out. It was, it was a nightmare. We'd ride the subways with our film cans in hand, show them to distributors and screening rooms, wait outside nervously, drinking coffee, pacing around, reciting the lines that we would say to him about how good we thought it would be and rehearsing our dialogue. We'd come in when the movie was over, He'd be sleeping, you know. Is it over? So we had a lot of very discouraging experiences. All knows. Luckily for Sam, the film met with a different response in Europe. After a screening at the Cannes Film Festival, it was picked up for distribution in Britain by Palace Pictures. Oh. 
UK audience embraced it and they made it a big hit along with very good marketing of Palace Pictures, of course. And uh, after that, the United States said, what's that? What's that little horror picture that's doing so well over there? Despite its popularity, the film has one scene that some people found offensive. In it, one of the teenage girls is brutally assaulted in and by the woods. As a result, the film was almost banned from release on video. Mm. Regret putting it in? I do. I do. On what grounds? Well, I think it was unnecessarily gratuitous and a little too brutal. And I finally, because people were offended in a way that I, I my goal is not to offend people. It is to entertain, thrill, scare, make them laugh, but not to offend them. But, you know, I know a lot of 19-year-olds that are stealing cars and murdering people. Not to, put, not to make that comparison, but I think I, my, my judgment was a little wrong at that time. The Incredibly Strange Film Show will continue on TDC TV. Wings, Tuesdays and Sundays. They considered a hot young talent, and Hollywood beckoned. The result was a deal with the studio, Embassy, and a new film, a comedy thriller called Crime Wave. Sadly, it was not quite what Sam wanted it to be. The problem with that movie, one of its many problems, was it didn't know what it was about. It was a comedy, it was a drama, it was an adventure picture, it was a love story, and it turned out to be none of the above. But what did you intend it to be? I wanted to, it to be the ultimate picture of entertainment. To thrill, chill, make the audience laugh, cry, scream, they screamed for their money back. Well, it really wasn't that bad, and it contained some wonderful set pieces, like this one. for the first time and so we didn't schedule it properly again we didn't budget it properly so we started to go over schedule over budget and the studio people said you know they'd fly in their their uh, cutthroat men and say you know what pages do we tear out here you know and so the script would be revised in order to stay on schedule and it was a lot of give and take we didn't have nearly the freedom as our first film because investors aren't going to come on the set a dentist isn't going to say are you sure that camera angle's right? You know, how many pages did you shoot today? They don't care. So we, they never set foot on the set, but with Crime Wave, they were in our face all the time, and it was a very tough experience. They replaced my actors. They threw Bruce Campbell out of the lead. They threw out my mus musician, Joe LaDuca. They recut the picture. They had their own say with the sound effects and mix. They did everything they could to make it what it is today. Despite the problems he had in making it and its subsequent failure at the box office, Crime Wave still has many moments of great originality. Although Sam now has projects in development for the major studio Universal, he hasn't totally abandoned the world of low-budget independent movies. Here we are in downtown Los Angeles on the set of Night Crew, a new shocker directed by Sam's old school friend and co-writer Scott Spiegel. Sam, tell us what you're doing here today. What are you working on? This is a, a movie Scott's making called Night Crew, horror picture, and I play a small role of Randy the Butcher. He does cute things like uh, eat uh, olives and uh, 
the killer has placed a uh, eyeball in a jar of olives. And he's just about to eat it, and, well, you'll see the movie. And uh, he does all kinds of funny things and, and cool things until his grisly demise on a meat hook. Get set for an all-night shopping spree with The Night Crew, starring Elizabeth Cox of Sixteen Candles and Sam Raimi, director of Evil Dead 1 and 2. Good evening, Walmart Lake shoppers. It's closing time. The store will be closing in 15 minutes. But The Night Crew still has work to do. Oh, my God, we're going to get in so much trouble. Because there's one last customer who isn't satisfied. No, this creep keeps calling you. He's driving us nuts. Leave me alone. He wants to slash their prices. Ah! Now, he's turning their retail store. There's going to be one more kill in here tonight. Into a wholesale slaughterhouse. This is Night Crew, and this actually aren't what you think they are. This has nothing to do with a cow. These are human parts. Which one of those was Sam? Uh, let's see. Well, well the ham's not here, so. <coughs> uh, <laughs> just kidding. A little joke. Uh, okay. Okay. Any idea where it might be? Okay, fine. Just let's do it. It should be okay. here. Ready? Uh, let's be on the camera and say okay? Sam? Yeah. Hey, buddy, you don't need to go in that meat cooler. I can't see that door opening. Okay. So, you got it. Now, maybe? Yeah, Wait a minute. Right. I lied. Just do your motions just like you did before. I lied. Okay. You want any different? I'll give you whatever you want. No, that's just fine. Do you enjoy acting in other people's movies? Yeah, I do. I especially do because it serves as very good instruction for me as a director. Because I can, as an actor, I hear direction and I think, oh, I see. Actors need more direction than he's giving here, or, gee, I'm really glad he said that because uh, I wouldn't have as a director, and I realized that an actor would need that here. So I learn, uh, I'm always learning bits and pieces about directing from uh, just being in them. Guys, whenever you're ready, please. Okay. Here we go. Fight. And. Just undertake. Fight two. 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 The stuff is good. Okay. Ready? ready? All right. <laughs> Show me. Okay, that's right. Marker. Stop is good. Action. The Evil Dead 2 with Sam. What were you trying to do? How were you trying to make it differently to the first film? Um, well, Sam and I were just trying to figure out um, there's only so many things you can do in the horror genre without just repeating yourself. And we just thought that we might just make it as wild and, and maniacal as we humanly could. So that's we just went overboard, just over the top with everything. Some humorous, some gory, some scary. <laughs> Did Sam genuinely want to make Evil Dead 2, or was it just because that was the easiest project to get off the ground? Um, it was probably a combination of the two. I think after Crime Wave, he needed to, he wanted to, and I know, uh, just to make a movie that worked, and we knew that Evil Dead 2 would work, and that it had a certain audience, and it could make money for somebody, and that we could make a good picture out of it for which are really right reasons to make a movie. Uh, I know there are other tales that we may have rather have told, but they were much more expensive and beyond our range. Evil Ed 2 uh, was taken around by Robert Tappert, Bruce Campbell, and myself to about 12 different companies out in Los Angeles, financing distribution companies like Crown International, um, Columbia Pictures, MGM, Universal. And we met with constant rejection until we brought the script to 
De Laurentiis Entertainment Group, which is now, I think, defunct. But nevertheless, uh, we showed the script to Dino, and uh, he said, How much you want for this picture? So we said, uh, we told him what we needed, which was basically uh, three and a half million to four million. And he said, Okay. We had all the figures for how the picture had done in all the theaters in Rome on Evil Dead. And so when we went, went to meet Dino, knowing that he knew all the theaters in Italy, we took him all the grosses of how it did in Rome, and he was able to go through them and say, okay, I'll make the movie. And that was, uh, and it was just that simple. Once we got to Dino, it was one day, and then he said, the next day, go to North Carolina, can you shoot it there? Evil Dead 2 didn't disappoint the fans. Picking up from where number one left off, it's faster, sharper, funnier, and scarier than its predecessor. Rob and myself and Bruce thought that that was all there was to Evil Dead. This horrible creature came at Bruce and the movie ended. But uh, Bruce was saved by positive box office response. And uh, this time we were able to surround Bruce Campbell with a much higher caliber of professional actor as opposed to just the local Detroiters in the theater groups. Really, every aspect of the production was now manned by a professional, where before it was uh, people who we could get off the street who would do it for next to nothing. So how did that affect the way you were? It was wonderful. I, I uh, was captain of a ship that now had trained professionals running the uh, engine room and the steering deck, as opposed to uh, trying to bail out water from my rowboat just to make sure I stayed afloat. We didn't want to create a movie that would have, you know, cause kids to have nightmares. That wasn't the goal. It was just to give them a roller coaster ride for 90 minutes and they could go home and forget about it. And so Evil Dead 2 was even more like that, really. We wanted to have a mass or a wider appeal. So we took out some of the real gore and put in a couple of Three Stooges type gags. It's as much a black comedy as a horror film. This is one of the more bizarre scenes in which our hero, Bruce, is taunted by his own hand after having chopped it off. How much of the humor was intentional in? Um, in the hand scene, it was intentional. We tried to make it uh, eerily funny. There's an appalling pun in there, isn't there, concerning a, a Hemingway book. Have you got any shame, Sam? No. <laughs> Now when it comes to telling jokes, bad jokes for the audience, anything that could get a laugh, I'm usually in favor of. Here's your new home. With a much bigger budget, a more ambitious script for The Evil Dead 2, Sam knew that the special effects had to be absolutely top-notch. So he came here to a studio in Pasadena, California, to work with the man responsible for the Nightmare on Elm Street series, Mark Shostrom. favorite special effects scenes in the movie? I think anything involving Henrietta, which is part of this creation here. This is Henrietta in a later stage, isn't it? This is Henrietta after his or her head transforms. And the poor unfortunate chosen to play Henrietta was Sam's brother, Ted Raimi. We had to put Ted Raimi 
in a stunt harness on wires and put the suit on him and the makeup, you know, a six hour makeup job. So before the day even began, he was extremely uncomfortable. They hoisted him on the wires. He's floating around the room. He's got contact lenses in. He's sweating. And Sam's going, look this way. Yeah, OK, now act. Now hit your mark. And uh, it was uh, it took about three days to shoot that whole scene. It sounds like the worst job in the world. For Ted Ramey, I'm sure it was. Is that why he used his brother? He knew he could get away with it. Sam knew he could. It was a, it was a very smart move. do you feel with the finished product label day two? It's okay. I think it's okay. Uh, it was a fine picture to make when I was 26, and now that I'm 28, I want to make a picture that's probably about 10 times as good. Final scenes of Evil Dead 2 left Sam the option of bringing back Bruce at least one more time, although there are no plans at the moment. Instead, Sam is intent on making a film which he hopes will reach a much wider audience than just horror fans. Oh man, he's got the, the best visual style of anyone around today an incredible visual style and a sense of pacing, which is another thing that I think is very important in directing. I think he learns an incredible amount every time he makes a movie. And it, I think that's a good indication because the more he makes, I think the better he's gonna get. I'm waiting for him to reach his full potential uh, because then I think he'll make a movie that everyone will respect. I mean, something that is of a capper or a Spielberg. I think he has those qualities to, uh, of a great director. I love movies, and I love entertaining the audience, or I love trying to entertain the audience. I mean, uh, I'm not making any bold claims. I'm just saying uh, my goal is to thrill people with the movies, and hopefully when I'm a good enough filmmaker to enlighten, uh, not enlighten, but what I mean to say is uh, uplift them. Uplift them. That's the word I mean to say. The Incredibly Strange Film Show will continue on TDC-TV. Best of the BBC, Sundays at 7 Eastern on the Discovery Channel. Timing is everything at your Cadillac dealer. Because right now, when you buy a new 1991 Cadillac, you'll receive up to a $2,500 bonus. Summer movie recap is just a half hour away.